Greetings, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sarah Zeller Berkman, and I'm the academic director of the Youth Studies program here at CUNY SPS. Um, so I have the pleasure tonight of introducing um, Dr. Bishop. But before I do, I just want to tell you a little bit about our program here. Um, so we have a master's, a 30 credit master's in youth studies um, and a 12 credit advanced certificate in youth studies. And this is really a degree for youth workers. So people that are direct service practitioners, people that are supervisors, people that are multi-site supervisors. Um, and and it's, a, <clears throat> it's also something for people that are coming through other parts of CUNY and have done undergraduate youth studies programs and really kind of want a higher level of education um, in youth studies. So there are five things that make our program unique. And um, number one is that we always um, combine theory and practice. So this happens within each class and also across the curriculum. Two, we give a sense of socio-historical context, um, but also really current promising practices in our field. Three, we have an explicit commitment to social justice. So this is really about a youth development, um, not to fit young people into structures or programs or things that aren't working for them, but really a, a social justice. Uh, we are aiming to shift status quo in partnership with young people. Um, and we have an intersectional approach. So we look at race, class, gender, sexuality, immigrant status, disability, and how that impacts young people's development, but also how they're perceived, et cetera. And lastly, we have a participatory and kind of strength based approach. Um, so you can see from our commitments um, that it has everything to do about why we're so excited to have Dr. Bishop here sharing her book um, about becoming activist and, um, and also why she's a perfect fit as a professor in our program. So she's teaching the Youth, youth Action and Agency class um, as well as research methods and she is beloved, um, <laughs> admired, <laughs> in our program. Um, and she is, uh, you know, somebody that works the hyphen of activist, scholar, practitioner, um, and kind of works all of those positionalities to, um, to push youth participation and also educate youth workers about um, how to make that happen in a quality way. So I'm going to give a brief um, overview of her accomplishments because there are many, many, many. So I'm just going to give you the quick and quick and dirty. Um, Dr. Bishop currently serves as Director of Curriculum and Outcomes Evaluation um, and Supervisor of Digital Leadership and Learning at Global Kids, an amazing organization here in New York City. Um, besides her work at uh, Global Kids and here at CUNY SPS, Bishop is on the research team at the Queering Education Research Institute housed at Hunter College, and she directs the Drop Knowledge Project where she conducts research on literacy and activism. Previously, Bishop taught on the Faculty of English Education and, Women's and Women and Gender Studies at Ithaca College. She served as Deputy Director at the Center for Institutional and Social Change at Columbia Law School and as an Assistant Director of the Peace Corps Fellows Program at Teachers College, Columbia University. Um, she began her career you know, on the ground as a public school teacher in the Bronx and has worked in many in-school and out-of-school time settings. Um, and she has many credentials. I'll, I'll tell you a few. She holds a PhD in language literacy and culture from the University of Pittsburgh School of Education, an MST in adolescent education from Pace University, an MA in literary and cultural studies from Carnegie Mellon University, and a BA in planned studies from Ithaca College. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tonight, Dr. Bishop um, will present lessons learned from her research with five self-described activists here in New York City, um, really demonstrating how the development of critical literacy skills plays a significant role in how young people address um, injustice. So, and just to this is her first book. Her second book will be in 2018. Um, so I'm going to give it to you. Take us away. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I want to also make sure to thank the folks that have joined us on the webinar and to ask you to bear with me as I move through this presentation and then we're going to open up for a Q&A at the end and there is a chat 
box available for you to shoot questions um, our way. So, um, and also just thank you to Sarah, of course, for her vis visionary leadership in this program, um, and also to Heather and the events management who really made this whole thing super flawless. So, um, I'm gonna jump right in, and you know, this is a lot of content, but we're gonna we're gonna move swiftly through it. Um, and I really want to honor the young folks who are in the text, um, who of course aren't here because of IRB and research ethics. So. Um, their, their voices and their language is going to feature prominently throughout this presentation as a result. Um, so I wanted to start, if we can, there we go, with, um, these are actually, this is a very overwhelming slide, they're not all this overwhelming, but I went back into my notes and looked a little bit at what were the early designs of this research before I did it. So in the yellow at the top, this is 2010, 2011 when I was first thinking about what I might want to end up doing that turned into this book. Um, and I was really focused on working collaboratively with youth activists and organizers in order to document the work that they were doing. So their anti-oppressive work and various forms of representation that they were undertaking. Um, in terms of context, I was super interested in thinking about youth organizing projects as innovative out of school spaces for critical education and um, social action work. And we'll talk more about that. Um, I'm a student of language, and so very much so this is about language for me and thinking about kind of challenging what is sometimes perceived of as radical um, in, in negative ways, right, and understanding that to be radical actually means to grab at the root um, in all of its etymological senses. So I actually had this quote from Henry Giraud from 1998 in some of my earliest designs here, um, and I won't read to you a ton off of the screen, but I will share this with you, in which he says, Critical educators challenge ethically limp discourses, privatization, national standards, global competitiveness, while simultaneously providing ethical signposts for public discourse about education and democracy, and the need to produce critical public spaces of education as a process of social change that takes place across multiple sites outside of school. So this is 1998, you're talking 20 years ago that some of this came to the fore. So this, these are some of the early design notes. Um, and of course, the book Becoming Activist is the result, but I stand on the shoulder of all of these other academics who came before me. So um, this is a quick snap of an element of my library um, that, that helped build this up for me. So I'm gonna dive right into the research. There were two fundamental research questions, and I have some research method students in the room who know how painstakingly we research and workshop questions. So it took me a while to get to these exact questions, and even now I've got a critique of them. Sure, take photos if you want. Um, <laughs> So there were two levels of questions here. The first was about how do urban youth organizers engage in critical literacy praxis as they become activists? I'm gonna get into the detail of what a lot of this language means as I go, but there were some sub-questions here. These youth organizers, what are they reading and researching as they're identifying topics that they wanna ha have activism and organizing mobilization around? What are they consuming and critiquing? And how are they responding to texts? And what are they creating? in response to what they're understanding. How are they disseminating it to what audiences with what purpose? So that's really why, um, despite kind of any big questions out there about why this is about literacy, this work, it is fundamentally about literacy. Um, there's a second layer here, and it's, it has to do with how folks, young folks articulate their own visions of themselves as activists. So um, I come from a cultural theoretical tradition of post-structuralism, meaning that I'm not looking for a single definition of activism to emerge from any of this. I never was. Um, what, I, what I was interested in is how are the young people involved in this work? How do they define activism themselves? And what relationship do they have to the texts and contexts of activism, the ones they take in and the ones they produce? So there's a background here. Um, so I'll briefly trace for you the critical literacy theory out of which some of this emerges. Um, it has deep tradition in critical pedagogy, and I'm sure this is a text that's not unfamiliar to most folks in this room, Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, in which he really underscored the political dimensions of experience and the need to have to initiate social change with quote unquote oppressed persons by identifying structures of oppression in communities and then acting to redress those conditions. So the identification is important. Almost um, 20 years later, Freire and Macedo came out with the text literacy, reading the word in the world. And often if you are tapped into the critical literacy discourse at all, that's really the kind of most essential way you could frame this conversation is reading the word and the world, right? Beyond just kind of classic decoding. So 
um, in this text, they posit that those who are critically literate, not only do they understand the meaning of things and how, how meaning is socially created, but also the political and economic context in which those things are created. Who owns the press? What's the copyright? What access emerges from these things? Early questions, 1987. In 1990, two texts came out in the same year that both kind of uh, pushed us in the direction of what we now know as critical literacy in a transformative model. So uh, Langshire McLaren had an edited text called Critical Literacy, Politics, Praxis, and the Postmodern, in which they identified three forms of educational practice that critical literacy can take on, varying by levels of commitment to modes of inquiry and action. So the first is interpretation. Right, the idea, and this is kind of your classic like AP literature space, that interpretation is allowed. You could think different things, but inevitably contradiction is to be avoided. There's a second level, which is, pushes a little bit further, that has an emphasis on tolerance. Right, but tolerance, as we know, often means that there is a, a mainstream status quo from which you are tolerating otherness. So the third and more complex arm of this to me is the idea of direct emancipatory action in the world, taking language, taking other sorts of text, um, and affecting change out of that. So at the same time, same year, Knobloch and Brandon put out a text in which they identified four approaches, somewhat similar. Um, the rhetoric of objectivism, right, which is kind of your positivist or post-positivist, that there are certain truths and uh, are foolhardy not to understand them. There's a politics of nostalgia, a wishing for an a time that has passed where truth or simplicity existed. Not that that was ever really true, but um, the idea of personal growth, right? This is kind of like reader response that you read something and you can personally grow from it. And then again, the more transformative element of it, which is the socio-political activist side of things, which is not just looking at yourself, but looking across social, political and cultural spaces. So really foregrounding here, to quote, the relationship of language and power with practical knowledge about how to use language to advocate for social critique, for cultural transformation. So uh, the contemporary critical literacy research, and this is contemporary, it's contemporary to the text when it came out, there's been subsequent research, it was really talking about what does it look like to do critical literacy research and work in ways that support, quote unquote, democratic pedagogy, right? Spaces that are foregrounding historical, cultural, or social issues. And a lot of this is grounded in ELA, in English language arts, in history curricula, um, which we're looking at how do you consume texts? What are you producing? How are you distributing? Um, similarly, a, a lot of critical literacy research in the mid 2000s was looking at what are ways that literacy work can move you, quote unquote, towards change. And that's, it's in, in theory, is a big idea, um, has many different iterations for what it looks like. And so Singer asks, like, what does your activist story teach about movements towards making positive change? Borsheim and Patron had um, a study where they were looking at what does it mean to teach the research paper for local action. And here's where you start to see some of kind of the classic liter critical literacy taxonomies emerge, that young people are identifying social and political topics, that they're conducting research and outreach, that they're writing academic research, kind of in your classic sense of a, a final paper or product, but that they are also producing real texts for real audiences. And we can talk more about what that looks like in the Q&A as well. Um, and then Phelps in 2010 had a study that was really looking at what does it mean to do critical literacy work to try to combat um, Islamophobia and xenophobia in, in the United States. So this just kind of brings you up to speed a little bit on where some of the research was. So for me, um, looking across the history of this research, I identified five overlapping components that I used to frame critical literacy throughout the course of this study. And um, they're not an isolation. They very much are kind of, um, it's not a linear trajectory. They are that you're mobilizing learners as social actors with knowledge and skills to disrupt the commonplace. Conducting research analysis and interrogation of multiple viewpoints on any given issue identifying those same issues in the context of the lives of learners. So there's a real sense of relevance and culturally relevant and sustaining space, designing and undertaking actions focused on justice outside of the classroom, also inside the classroom. But a huge element of this is spaces outside of classic academic space, and then reflecting on those actions that are taken and creating visions for the future. So this is, brings you right up to speed in terms of where I am when I'm talking about critical literacy. There's some substantial limitations to critical literacy work that does happen in schools. Now, I want to be very clear because I'm asked this question all the time. I, don't, I, I think that critical literacy work can and does happen inside of academic and school-based environments all the time. 
but there have been historically some conceptual challenges and some practical challenges. So conceptually, critical literacy has been critiqued as being too pedagogically loose of a model or too politically activist and or. Um, that literacy practices inside of schools tend to primarily function in ways that sustain dominant cultural norms and ideologies and that critical literacy is going to try to overturn those and that's going to complicate the discourse in that space and that the goals of critical literacy don't reflect the overwhelmingly hierarchical relationship that exists in traditional classroom spaces. Um, in practice, and this, this quote always stands out to me, uh, because of the nature of critical research, students are likely to ask questions that some people would prefer that they don't ask about some topics that people would prefer that they don't address. And again, and Beck follows and says, it's not a good idea to teach critical literacy in settings where silence is encouraged, such as prisons and schools. Even when students consider socio-political, cultural, and ideological issues, and they could take action, they frequently won't if they're not explicitly supported to do so. And so that's a really huge element that some of those initial st steps and stages of critical literacy happen. But when it comes to the moment of taking that action, that move into action, that sometimes there's limitations that really prevent that. So just to be clear, I strongly align with the idea that you can do critical literacy work inside of schools and at the same time recognize that there are sometimes limitations. Um, the last two texts that came out right before I was writing this book that really spoke to me about the actionable elements of critical literacy were two. Ernest Morell's 2004 ethnography called Becoming Critical Researchers, um, where he was looking at the relationship between academic achievement in literacy spaces literacy development in action, social action research in summertime programming with young folks. And his project really demonstrated the need to look further into the study of activism as it relates to the development of young folks as critical citizens through a lens of critical literacy. So Morel has certainly written ad infinitum on this topic. And I, I deferred to a lot of his work in my earliest research. Um, at the same time, Blackburn and Clark had put out a 2007 edited text called Literacy Research for Political Action and Social Change. And in this text, they identified the explicit need to take critical reading and text production outside of classroom spaces and into activist spaces with young folks so that they could engage in immediate needs for social action and social change that weren't necessarily regulated um, within school-based interests. So for me, this very much pointed to the question, where can critical literacy be more fully realized? And so um, across the things that I was looking at and thinking about and, and anecdotally in the know about, for me, this was youth organizing that was really a compelling space to think about critical literacy actualization. So for those of you who want a quick uh, background, I locate here approaches to youth organizing um, in, in kind of the space where community organizing meets youth development and positive youth development, critical pedagogy. And we can talk a lot more about this. Sean Ginwright, who has been really uh, on the forefront a lot of the publications around this in his 2010 book, um, Black Youth Rising, says young people are conceived of as agents of, not subjects to change in youth organizing spaces, and that their rights and skills to, are ex to exercise um, change in the present as community leaders is what's really foregrounded in organizing spaces, which I find very compelling. So um, this one, I guess, is a little bit hard to see, but um, in 2012, Heinz Foundation funded a study that was looking at various models for youth engagement. And what I find most compelling about this particular infographic is that it talks about different moves across here. So you see youth services as kind of intervention in the lives of young people, where they may be your clients. Youth development, where young folks are participants, and sometimes workers, towards more collective work. Youth leadership, youth civic engagement, where young folks are leaders and that they're staffing various um, advisory boards, leadership councils, things of this nature. And then they posit youth organizing as a model for systemic change that is driven by and alongside young folks. So um, it, it really can be activism as the model for pedagogy around critical literacy. So to me, what was significant about picking up this book that I'm about to spend the rest of this time telling you about was that the study of critical literacy with youth organizers is significant for considering what are some alternative spaces of informal learning outside of school where this work can be done, and this deep literacy work. So that history of critical literacy in theory and practice, looking at some of the limits that emerge in, in school-based spaces, really pushes youth organizing as an alternative context for critical literacy learning. So that was really where the need for the present study 
emerged um, to bridge the gap between some of the limitations of critical literacy in classrooms and a real lack at the time of research on literacy in organizing spaces. So that's where this book comes in. Um, and as I talk about the text, I'm definitely going to be sure to, to read to you a bit from the young folks that are in it. There were a few goals for me when thinking about how to design research that wasn't um, that wasn't kind of your classic ethnographer on the outside telling other folks about their experiences, but to explore alongside youth organizers how they were engaging in critical literacy practices, how they were uh, articulating their identities as emerging activists and how that was evolving. I was interested in considering what the implications of that would be for further study, which is something I continue to, to focus on, and to facilitate a wider dialogue, including this evening, around uh, organized activists, educators, and are interested in thinking about how to do work that contributes to greater connectivity and collectivity. So um, without going too far down an epistemological uh, hole, I will spend just a second talking about how some of the theoretical frameworks matters. You're laughing because you know that it's epistemology all the time sometimes, but um, for me the ethical political had a lot to do with foregrounding the subjectivity of the young folks who are involved in the research, right? Oftentimes people who are involved in research are seen as the objects of study um, and their subjectivity isn't actually at the core of the work. So I was really interested in this idea of research as praxis and knowing that there were undecidable things um, to, and I cite Patty Lather here and I do later as well, that there were there was a need for an emergent design that I was going to be influenced entirely by the young folks who were involved in the process with me and that I was willing for the research relationships to evolve and thus the project collaboratively to evolve at the same time. So conceptually, that's what it looked like. In practice, I was really interested in having a study that was of service to a wider conversation, not just to go into the library right, and to just sit on the shelves, but how could this research actually support further training of youth activists and organizers and educators. Um, and of course, there's an element of this uh, when I talk about post-structural polyvocality. But what that means, right, is having spaces that don't totalize somebody else's narrative. Polyvocality means many voices, right? So that participatory research really looks like that creating spaces where you can work with youth hum human rights or activists and social justice organizers and have them articulate their identities and their experiences in, in a way that was strategically about multiplicity and the multiplicity of their voices and their experiences. So the design, um, the research setting and participants. So I'm gonna take some time to, to articulate this out. So I had um, started my career as a public school teacher. And at that time I was lucky enough to have global kids in my classroom doing a residency. And one of the things um, that I was introduced to at the time as a public school teacher was one of a few of their after school programs, one of which was the Human Rights Activist Project, um, which is a social action side of uh, programming. And so uh, the subsequent, subsequently, I went and worked the organization for a year. I'm back now, I couldn't be happier. There's been some time in between, but I've always been, and I say in my book as well, a strong proponent of the work. So um, I purposefully sampled a diverse group of young folks who were alumni of the project. I wasn't working on behalf of the organization. I wasn't trying to speak on behalf of them. I was more interested in understanding how the young folks themselves individually were articulating what their experiences had been. So their shared history is that they were in these spaces, but it wasn't like an organizational study. It was about the young folks themselves. Um, and that was really their shared context historically. So initially I had designed this as a critical autoethnographic study right, not ethnography in its classic, let me tell you about your culture, um, but autoethnographic to the extent that I was gonna be telling my story and the young folks are gonna be telling theirs. And then critical ethnography as one that has always got kind of a socio-political trajectory on it. So this was designed through methods of interview observation and artifact analysis. There were quite a few limitations in the actual implementation of the study, some of which had to do with access. Me either not being in, um, allowed in spaces because I didn't have credentials or identification, or because I wasn't an insider to those communities. And I really respected that. So overwhelmingly, the study was restricted to qualitative interview. There is some artifact analysis and observation that's conducted, but the qualitative interview really served as the forum for retelling and reconstructing some of the activist work. And it, it gets closer to um, what uh, Lawrence Lightfoot calls portraiture in this way, and um, and a little bit about life history, but not with, not with a singular trajectory. So I was dialoguing with the young folks um, around their literacy learning as they were articulating their activist um, experiences. 
So in terms of analysis, um, you'll see, you know, I, I was trying to engage in a form of critical discourse analysis. And in educational research, CDA has a deep history. Um, and I'm not going to get into all of that. But for me, I come from a cultural studies background. So when I think about discourse, I think, of, I think about Foucault. Um, and I think about what are the systems of power and modes of practice that are either offering spaces of liberation or constraint. And how are those discourse spaces, spaces from which truth and falsehood is produced, that you are or are not an activist, that you are or are not allowed to do or be in certain ways. So the forms of analysis that are in the text and throughout the study, the first phase um, was, this, was that critical literacy taxonomy that I talked about earlier, uh, really looking at examples of iterations of these various things in the experiences of these young folks. And then I picked up Chantal Mouffe's um, articulation theory, which comes from her post-structuralist ontology, um, looking at what are the elements, what are the relational signifiers, such as a word activist, for instance, um, that may have lack meaning in themselves, right, as a signifier, but through his, in historical, socio-historical moments, meaning is, social meaning is produced. So activists will look and mean different things in different contexts at different times. And that, that sense of difference and multiplicity is huge here. So in terms of validity, um, validity is, is often a really praiseworthy thing in terms of proving that your work matters. And of course, validity and reliability are, are essential. So again, here I defer to Patty Lather, whose 2007 book, Getting Lost in Social Science Research, um, she foregrounds the idea of transgressive validity, that language will be insufficient to make sub, uh, like final statements that you can gesture towards the problematics of representation, including expectations within social science research, um, that it's appropriate to foster difference and heterogeneity, to supplement and exceed the stable and the permanent, right? To complicate our thinking and understanding and to embody a practice that is situated, partial and explicitly tentative, right? Rather than making any kind of final authoritative statements and really bringing together an ethics and an epistemology. And for me, Lather is very much writing against this image of kind of the classic ethnography looking in on someone else's culture and making judgments and statements. So this is where it gets real interesting. The study participants, um, they all chose self-selected pseudonyms. And um, so these are the names that they chose. Vaga de Franks, Awesome Woman, Green Strawberries, People's Republic of Mars, Gentle Meadows, and that's me, the punk rock garbage can on the right. So what you see in, in the five slides, come on in. There's some seats in the front exactly reserved for you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you're just walking into the right moment because I'm talking about some of the HRAP youth who are involved in this study. So what you see on the, sli on the following slides are quick um, portraits of the various young folks who were involved in the study. And so there's a few things here, but then I'm going to read you some of their words. So I did a frequency analysis of some of the language that they were using as they were talking about their activist experiences. So that's what you see on the left here in the word cloud. They also each chose an image to serve as kind of like their avatar for any of the work that we did. And then also there was um, a cloud that shows the issues and campaign uh, topics around which they were mobilizing. So you can see these as I read you a few words from each of them. So this is Vaga de Franks, who says, quote, on any given event, when people ask me, what do you really do? I say, well, we organized for about four months. We connected, we fly at our campus, we talk to people, we tirelessly outreach to professors, we annoyed administration and annoyed security for months. And we did it with the idea in our minds that there were other students on other campuses who were doing the same and that we had an opportunity to secure that community on our campuses because there was somebody on another campus doing the same. Subsequently, I asked her to talk a little bit about how she got so good at interrogating multiple perspectives on issues. And she says, it's funny because of all the student organizers that I met, everybody always tells me that I am the most neutral and that I am the most non-sectarian. And I really am the least sectarian organizer I've come across. And I think that that's because of the workshops that I learned and the skills I developed at Global Kids and organ other organizations that really allowed me to develop the patience and understanding and ability to break things down, to break information down, to listen to experience and analyze them and really look past all of that theory and personalize it. And then she says, you know, when you do a workshop and you have your audience, you have a shitload of information you're supposed to cram into their brains in 45 minutes. And the way of learning within a workshop 
different than learning in an institution and different than just organizing. A workshop, you get there and it's most often a circle. You see everyone's face and you're looking at each other. You give information in an interactive way. It's very physical and entertaining. You don't ask your audience to sit and list for you a number of socialist leaders in Soviet Russia. You ask them, what do they know about socialism? You ask very basic questions. It really makes people question themselves and not get patronizing. It really means they're going along with the workshop and learning together. And we have this safe space that allows everyone to not feel self-conscious about a lack of theory or how much they might know. So when I'm in groups or in meetings, I can do that with people. We have a lot of problems because people don't know how to do that. People who are plugged into the student movement don't even know what safe space is and are fighting for social justice and practicing theory that's about justice, but they don't know what safe space is and they don't realize how important it is to always implement it. So we held a workshop last week on space and it was the first time that we had ever done that. Gentle Meadows. And Gentle Meadows, if you can picture a Gentle Meadow, that's Gentle Meadows. So when I met Gentle Meadows, he was a senior in high school in Queens. Um, and throughout our dialogues, we talked about the various multiple perspectives that he had. And he said, from food production to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, Israel and Palestine, which was a very hot topic in women's rights, what I remember most is the LGBTQI day, which was very controversial for the people there. And I asked him why it was controversial, in which he said, in our high schools combined, a vast majority of students come from immigrant backgrounds. And on issues like immigration and things like that, they might be progressive. But on other things like cultural issues, they would be like whether women should be treated equal as men and acceptance of not just tolerance, but acceptance of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex people. It was more up in the air for them. Some people do and some don't care and some don't know. So that dialogue definitely helps there. Books won't change that if you were reading them alone. They need to be discussed and you need to talk to other people. And then he says subsequently, when talking about identifying socio-political issues, um, he says, I would say that conversation and discourse are the most important. A lot of people would say it's not fruitful or it's not good for change, but by talking about something, people rethink what they previously thought. It's not taken for granted anymore. So the questioning that happens in your head, it brings up the idea that, oh, maybe there's different possibilities out there, not just the ones I've known all my life or that I have been taught in school by a different generation. So discourse and dialogue, it's a catalyst for change, definitely. Green strawberries. Green strawberries was, um, in, had a real international perspective on everything that we talked about as we talked together. And so she was, she and I were talking a ton about Occupy Wall Street at the time because the study was conducted right around 2012 um, and also about Palestine. And so she was highlighting some of the experiences that she had. And she started talking about how um, as central to her learning and her peer education was the art she was creating in response to the conditions of the people in Palestine. So I asked her what made Palestine so relevant for her. And she detailed her personal commitment as follows. The fact that these days I've been recognizing how whitewashed I am how whitewashed I've become, and I'm trying to go back to my roots. And the Palestinians are my brothers and sisters, right? What's happening to them is beyond ridiculous. So I feel like a lot of the Palestinian issues connect back, you know, to with my brothers and sisters in that way and their struggle and recognizing the connections of those struggles. That's why it was important to me. And I asked her, when you say you're brothers and sisters, you're not Palestinian, are you? And she said, no, I'm Pakistani and Afghani, but they're still my brothers and sisters. People's Republic of Mars. So our discussion included an emphasis on subordinate groups and ways to provide for the politicized articulation of counter narratives and self-determination amongst groups. And he was focused particularly on immigration policy and the struggle of undocumented persons. And he says, Dream Act. I love my work with immigration. When I was in high school, a lot of my friends, even though they were talented, super talented, and all the great very good, everything under their belt, but they couldn't go to good schools because of their immigration status, even though they lived here their whole lives, you know? So I'm always active whenever something like that comes up. And when a recent update happens, for instance, recently Obama kind of suspended the deportation of young undocumented immigrants who would have benefited from the DREAM Act. So updating people about things like that. The DREAM Act is something that I want to see passed. So sometimes I feel like I could do more work, not only on DREAM Act, just to get comprehensive mediation, I think the DREAM Act, that would be a first step. 
but working to make sure that there is comprehensive immigration reform passed. That's my form of activism. And then finally, Awesome Woman. Awesome Woman spoke so um, intentionally and at length that Awesome Woman takes up a ton of space in this text because she has so much to say and so many stories to tell. So I will tell you briefly um, two things that she said. One in which she was really questioning some of the textual intentions around how our our identities are perceived. And she, she took the notion of borders and picked that up talking about historical and current events. She said, there are borders, actual borders that we put up that don't make sense. Like families who have been separated for centuries because of lines that are superficial or artificial. I'm not, which, I'm not sure which word I'm looking for. And I said both, perhaps, which, to which she laughed and replied, within places, people separate themselves all the time, within the nation or whatever. And so now I'm interested in South Africa. And there was this really shitty special I watched the other day. And I was like, it's on, let me watch it. And it was called Global White Woman. And basically it was an exploration of beauty for white women in South Africa. And I was really upset. It was basically this Indian dude who was a self-identified Indian dude who was basically talking about his obsession with white women and why. And he was so misogynistic, I couldn't appreciate it. And at the end, I asked myself, why did I watch this? It didn't explore anything that was new to me. And I feel like it wasn't new to a lot of audiences. Like, we know white women are beautiful, are considered beautiful in South Africa. But why, really? And who came up with these ideas of beauty? That was not explored. So together, this is a frequency analysis of the words that, across all of my interviews with all of them, they said the most. And so... I know you can all see these, but the idea of knowing and knowing people and understanding difference and what's real and what's right and talking and thinking around activism um, and laughter and all of these other more humanizing elements, I let this stand in the space as well. And um, not just for, uh, you know, book sales, but I highly encourage you to read the text so that you can really see the language of the young folks throughout. So just to give you a sense of where we were and what we were doing, dots on this represent the spaces in which uh, we met together to design the work and to kind of uh, do analysis and push the work together. The green dots represent spaces in which they were engaged in organizing actions and events. And then the, the world map on the right shows the global connections that they made in talking about the various lenses upon which they were thinking about activist work. So there's some big conclusions here, and I'm not going to talk through all of them because I do want to make sure open up for conversation. But there were conclusions under each one of those elements of critical literacy terms of the ways in which the young folks were mobilizing themselves and, and through their life histories, really looking locally, but thinking globally um, and being very personally committed to whatever the political work was and, and really looking at like, what are the social elements of ourselves in this work? They conducted a ton of research and analysis around multiple perspectives, looking at different cross-cutting issues and, and thinking about the intersectionality and connection across those throughout. And they talk a ton about various ways that they designed and we're undertaking social justice actions. Some of this they talk about as quote unquote on the ground activism outside of school. Oftentimes folks think that this looks like protests and they spend quite a bit of time talking about the work that, that precedes and follows a single day of protest or action and other forms of creation and dissemination. So they were talking about the creation of zines, shareholder advocacy, uh, video blogs, all of these various other forms of iteration. And then and there was always space for reflection and um, you know, awesome woman said to me, the reason I wanted to be a part of this was because I want a book and I want a book that I can take in other spaces and that other young folks can learn and that we can grow together. And the, one of the last lines in the book is her saying, I'm going to be an activist until I die. So there's a second layer here, um, which was around like the articulation of their activist identities, because from the start, I didn't want this to be a singular definition of activism. Um, and I really want that to stand. So again, I'm not going to read it to you, but the first question I asked each one of them when we first sat down was, do you consider yourself an activist? It was really kind of the only threshold or benchmark. I suppose if they said no, we might not have conducted the study together, but they all said yes in various ways, um, including really recognizing the ways in which they're organizers, even beyond just kind of activist moments. So again, here, this is just to show you the ways in which uh, the MOVES articulation theory provides a space to really think about how do you make social meaning, right? Removed from anything that might just be like dictionary defined. There were conclusions throughout the text 
participants. They had a lot of conclusions for themselves and their trajectories. For me as a writer, uh, I've had a ton of reflection on where should I go next and how, how should this work evolve. For readers, there's a lot of invitations in the text um, to think about what does this mean for you and your work, to just regardless of who you are, that you're coming to this kind of with various um, connections to the space of organizing or literacy. And then, of course, for educators um, who I really admire and always hold up, both in school and out of school, in formal and informal spaces, as the folks who are pushing this work forward, as well as researchers, some of whom feel very confined in, in spaces of research and some of whom really crack open ideas of what does it mean to conduct research. And then wider academic spaces as well. So, of course, there's bigger connections here for organizers themselves, organizations, and wider networks of activisms. Um, and then there, these were kind of the big conceptual things for me, and here's where you see the post-structuralist drop, drop right back in. But um, thinking about the idea of care through alterity, and alterity is an idea from Levinas about trying to understand somebody else's experience, knowing that you can't ever get outside of your own. And so what does it mean to develop spaces of care that are both analog and digital um, and intersubjective, where you're sharing resources and experiences towards healing, towards radical healing. And so I talk about this a lot in terms of ethics that don't moralize um, ethical praxis and um, what it means to have like a queer theory of activism where the story of the self can be told and no one's going to tell you that your story of yourself is wrong. Um, and that that has a lot to do with the creation of safe spaces or safer spaces, perhaps. So future trajectories. Um, Drop Knowledge Project is what this project was named, Drop Knowledge Project NYC. And um, it has since has spawned some new iterations, which is exciting for me because that was always the intention to have kind of a facing space of research uh, to, to do this work. So, um, the Drop Knowledge, I was in Ithaca last year and some young folks who read this book with me decided to launch a Drop Knowledge Project Ithaca. Um, they actually just got some like about a few days ago on that. So it's interesting to watch them evolve and take ownership. And the first thing I'm doing is kind of saying to them, don't forget about IRB, don't forget about research ethics and be careful as you try to survey elementary school kids about sex ed, which is what they want to do right now. Um, and then also, you know, I had initial designs to conduct some more work focused explicitly on queer youth organizing. Um, so I had an initial grant from the Center for the Study of Women at UCLA to look at this in LA. And so I was looking to do comparative analysis both in LA and in New York. Um, and so those, those, are in, those phases are kind of up and slowly moving. And then some conversations with some folks in Miami and I actually have a young man who is an alum from Ithaca who's in France now. And so he's picking up Drop Knowledge Project France. And he sent me this image um, in advance of this presentation. But uh, he's really kind of moving and shaking, so look out for his blog to come up more. And then um, there is a book that's coming out subsequently uh, that's called Embodying Theory, Epistemology, Aesthetics, and Resistance. I wanted to call it Make Theory Walk, and my publisher told me that that's not good for search engine optimization. So it's called Embodying Theory, and it's really about like how do you take things like Foucault, Deleuze, Derrida, Chantal Mouffe, and make them walk in, in the world so that it's not some kind of academic ivory tower philosophy, but it's really about what does it mean to identify the function of power knowledge and the creation of truth, and what can you do when you understand that? So that's where we end and uh, open up for a conversation with those of you who are sending in questions, Q&A in the chat box, and those of you who are here in the space. Thank you so much. There's also quite a few young folks in the room, practitioners, and so it would be great if this is a kind of wide open conversation. I'm very open to that. Um, this was excellent. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what the surprising findings for yourself were going into this process, uh, what you learned about the young people, how it shifted your own research practice as you were going along? Sure, so um, you know, one of the things I learned a ton about them and their experiences and their evolving ideas, but I also really understood a lot about what it means to design research. Do you want to be participatory, collaborative, et cetera, and the ways in which that can be really complicated. Right from the start, I was saying to them, these are my research questions. What do you think? And they were like, you good? You know a lot. It's good. We're good. You know, and there was a sense of like, let's just do it. And I was like, no, but I want you to crit critique these. Let's change them. Let's revise them together. And, 
there was a bit of a deference to me regardless um, as someone with some age on them with some credentials, even though for me that doesn't change the conversation, but for them, you know, they were, they were struggling through trying to stay in school, trying to have you know, employment, right? How is secure housing to get done with their degrees and advance their careers. And so even though I really wanted a collaborative space of research, this was very much what I was thinking about 150% of my day. And perhaps they didn't have quite as much time to devote to that. So, um, there was a huge learning curve there. I was able to do some collaborative analysis with them. You know, I was constantly sharing transcripts and initial analysis and really hoping that they would be like, you got this all wrong. Like, this is what I think. And they were much more um, affirmative to say like, I like it, it's good, carry on. Which was good for me, but um, in some regards, right, to move this project along, much more interested in thinking about how do you create and sustain spaces where young folks can absolutely critique any of the frames that are coming from academic or, or research oriented spaces. I mean, the young folks themselves, they blew me away throughout. They were talking, I was buying books that they were talking about. I was like trying to go get inside of spaces that they were naming and they were really shedding light for me on the various things that they cared about and, and just send me kind of down the rhizomatic um, trajectories of like, there's so much more to explore on any of these given topics. And, you know, um, Kim Gomez, who, is at UCLA, but was one of my advisors at the University of Pittsburgh when I was doing this, she really kept pushing back to me in terms of activism. And she was like, you don't mean all activism. You don't mean necessarily white supremacist violent activism. Like you need to kind of find ways to name explicitly what sort of activism you're talking about because activism itself, and this kind of harkens back to the Chantal Mouffe thing, right? The word, the signifier, in some ways it's empty. I mean, it's loaded. For sure, activist is a very explosive term, but at the same time, there's a sense of activism that is re, uh, is exactly what's got folks from um, the most recent inauguration facing federal charges because windows were broken, right? There's that idea of activism, and the young folks in this space who I was working with and the work that I'm really committed to is about nonviolent, anti-oppressive spaces of activism, and sometimes that activism is information activism, it's teachbacks, it's not always, although sometimes it is, about standing in the street or petitioning your government for a redress of grievances. Thank you. Hi, my name is Adonis. You stated before that you were a teacher in the Bronx, right? Um, I'd just like to ask a question. How do you think that we can change the fundamentals in like school and stuff like that and like the basis of how we think in regards to educational? That's a great question. I would love to hear from some of the experts in this space as well who might have ideas. Um, but two things come to mind for me for sure. And the first is listen to young people. Um, to just listen to the young folks in these spaces, many of whom often aren't actually asked about what their experiences of schooling are um, because of other limitations and confines on their day or on the parameters of what's happening in that space. And you know, sec on the second level then is listen to parents, guardians, families, educators, administrators, listen listen in dialogue with folks who are there for the right reason. S schools will always be spaces, any institutional space will always be a space that has certain confines and constraints on it, just by definition of it having an institutional um, box around it. But that doesn't mean that it can't be dynamic, right? And so whether it's like flipped classrooms, connected learning, project-based work, some of this is, has very old history. And so I don't, you know, I've heard obituaries of education. Schools no longer can do X, Y, or Z because of X, Y, or Z. And I understand what that critique is, but I don't necessarily subscribe to it, right? I, I, every day, educators and young folks walk into schools at seven o'clock in the morning, right? And they stay, they stay for 12 hours and they're committed to that educative work. So if anything, I think elevating the voices of the young folks as well as the educators and the other adults who are there to, to push that work forward is huge. But I would love to know if other folks have ideas about what will that look like or what will it take? We can let it hang in the air. Hi, thanks for inviting us to this talk. Um, okay, so my question is, can you talk a little bit about your selection process for the youth in this research, why you chose five young people uh, just if you could take us step by step through that process. Sure. So let me try to go down memory lane for a second here. Um, you know, when I was first thinking about doing the work, I was talking with friends who also worked in the field of youth development and thinking, and some of whom we shared 
professional spaces or intellectual or academic spaces. And so I was really saying to them, who do you know as young folks who you think are um, really out there in their activist work would be interested in trying to build collaborative research? So fundamentally, this was about snowball sampling um, in its kind of basic sense. Like I asked someone who told me about someone who then told me about someone else. And so it's like some of the young folks in the book are there because they were like, I want to do this and you should bring my friend in too. So it was very much, I wouldn't call it convenient sampling because it wasn't that convenient. Um, and it also didn't, it didn't, uh, it didn't stay only in the space of particular young folks that I had worked with. Actually, I explicitly say in the book that the spaces in which I was facilitating, none of the young people who I facilitated with are in this in this study, right? Because you have to protect the folks that you work with. So um, it was kind of like a second circle. There, young folks who I knew, who had been involved in citywide or other branches of the Human Rights Activist Project the, in the time that I was involved, not ones who I had worked with myself one on one, because that's too close sometimes for the research, right? Like you take a look at a photo of me and trace it back and be like, I know that's who these people are. And so it's a wider sphere, and it really to me. Um, it could have been more. There was actually another young man who, um, if I could remember the pseudonym, he gave himself Dominican, Puerto Rican, Arab. Um, and he, he was supposed to be in this study too as well. And then because of housing and security, he was unable to continue with me. So um, I was trying to get a, not a, like, I don't really believe in quote unquote representative samples, right? We are intersectional and multiple, multiplicitous people. So I wasn't looking for like, one person to check every demographic category or something that would be kind of oversimplified in that way. But I wanted different young folks who come to activism from different frameworks, some more interested in becoming diplomats and some of whom are more interested in creating video blogs and to get a sense of young folks who are interested in different issues and who are willing to think across those issues together. So some of them knew each other, but they didn't know that they were in the work together in the study together, um, in terms of some of the research protections. And I never brought them together, even though initially that was something I was interested in, also because of some of the research protection. And I take that very seriously. Um, there were there were some young folks in this text who were gung ho to, you know, highlight everybody they knew and bring the voices of every undocumented person who they knew to this conversation, because of they wanted them in it. And I had a sense of I understand why you want to do that, but I also really want to protect you and your community because that's and your spaces because that's my job as a researcher is to not put you in risk or harm, even at the same time that we want to elevate your your experience. So, I mean, if I could do this again and I had a huge research team like everybody in this room, then we could have many more than five. Do we have a question online? Two. All right, so um, one question from Abigail. Can you talk more about the overlapping literacies within the multiple analog and digital spaces? Sure. Um, so, you know, uh, Gen, um, green strawberries when she because I was rereading a bunch of this in preparation for this conversation and she was talking a lot about how some of the first places that young folks go and this was then so you know it's even more true now is online to get a sense of what's happening with various issues right so they might first be made aware of some sort of um, injustice or grievance um, through reading an article or reading someone's personal post that they're writing somewhere. And the, in those moments, oftentimes there's opportunities to then connect with other folks. So um, I know for her, she was involved in a lot of what was happening with Occupy Wall Street. And some of those invitations were coming in person. But she herself and actually Vaga de Franks as well, they both talk a lot about how important it was to get analog, to get offline, to not have your IP address traced, um, and to feel like you could share information in old school ways. And so like Vaga de Frank spends a ton of time talking about um, mobilizing to try to make sure that the tuition uh, stayed low so that she and her classmates could stay in the institution that they were in. And they, they did some of that online, but they did a ton of it through interviews with people, um, conversations, writing down, jotting down notes, and then they created a zine as a result of that. And then they photocopied it and they left it stacks in libraries. They handed it out in various spaces. So um, in that way, it's kind of like, you know, you think about these days, you think about maker spaces or you think about like hacktivisms and those things are all super relevant, but they're not different necessarily than analog activism. It's just different tools, right? And so, and even in the spaces of ed tech, that's what folks tend to say. It's not that the, the educational or activist work is about the tool. It's that the tool helps you 
move forward on whatever it is that issue that you're trying to interrogate or, or make some organizational outreach and moves around. Thank you. Um, so listening to the words of the participants, I heard a lot of what seemed to be like hopeful speech and kind of beliefs. And I didn't get to stare and study the word clouds, but I was wondering um, if hope came up um, and then also if religion came up, thinking about the different backgrounds of the participants yeah. and people that you spoke with, if any anything was there? That's a good question. I um, I don't remember the word hope explicitly being stated, although I'm sure that it's in there. But the ethos of hope was very present, and I think this has a lot to do, like to shout back to Genrite for a second, with the idea that when you're in spaces that are either traumatizing or violent structurally, pers interpersonally, or otherwise, that oftentimes you end up holding two things at the same time. One is the recognition of of that violence and um, the oppressive or subjugated spaces that you're in. And the second is the need to do something about it. And I think one of the things that is inspiring to me about this work is that those young folks, these young folks and others like them who are engaged in this work um, in ATRAP and otherwise, they were moving across spaces. So it might not be that your personal identity was necessarily being attacked, but perhaps that, an, that one of your activist friends who was standing right next to you was. And so you, in, in that process, not only are you digging in for them, but also for yourself to stand in solidarity. And so I feel like, um, and, and I was talking to Mark Lesser yesterday on his podcast, and we're talking about the same exact thing that is, it's almost in the moment where you open the, you read a headline and there's such despair, right? Or you see policy or various things happening that are, make you wanna, you know, let your hair on fire. But it's like, what are you gonna do? If you let your hair on fire, are you gonna be able to mobilize in the same way than if you take that same, energy and passion and ignition that's occurring inside of you and figure out what are you going to do about it? How can you build spaces? So one of the conclusions from this text is very much about how can you create uh, what I call counter spaces to counter narrate, right? So if, if narratives are be being created about you without your permission or without your inclusion or, you know, without your involvement, how can you have an opportunity to say what is true for you and to kind of counter narrate against stereotyped or other kind of um, myopic understandings of your experience or of your, your culture. And so to me, that's where the hope came across. Um, religion came up a lot because the young people all came from different faith backgrounds. Um, and I would really invite you to read some of what they say because I couldn't do justice if I was trying to summarize, but Awesome Woman tells this incredible story about um, going to Sudan to study for a year and being seen, having been seen as an outsider here as a young Muslim woman, and then being seen as an outsider there as an American. And just all of the iterations of outsiderness and kind of the complexity around moralism and the role of women, for instance, or queer folks um, in, in those struggles. And so, you know, I really honor the faith-based conversation as it came in. And oftentimes in the conclusions of this work, I end up talking a lot about ethics and ethics in ways that don't moralize, right? Which means you're not gonna be told that who you are or how you are is right or wrong, but rather that wider conversations can emerge about how is meaning being created and how are we creating safer spaces um, and inclusive spaces together. Thank you, great talk, um, by the way. Um, I just have two questions. The first one um, has to do with about what I've heard um, earlier on about one of the young person or young people were talking about how appreciative they were to be around like safe spaces and also to be able to be be able to understand and speak to one another through dialogue and just collective knowledge. So I wanted to know from you what ways were you more um, you found ways to be more intentional in the reflection process. I know that's very important in, in collaborative research. And I wanted to know like what types of methods you use to be um, to drive home the reflection process. And the second part is that um, one of the young um, person as well spoke about um, the, like the interest in the arts. And I wanted to see what type of associations um, came to be in how they used art and advocacy outside of disseminating the designs. 
and if there and and also the videos that you spoke of earlier. Yep. So um, in terms of the the designs for reflection, um, I think there's two levels here. So as they were talking about safe space for them, a lot of that had to do some of some of it came directly out of the experiences of the workshops that they were involved in when they were at Global Kids and in some other youth or organizing and um, youth facing spaces that were really foregrounding um, certain guidelines to make sure that everybody's experiences and perspectives could come into the room, that it was okay to ask complicated questions, um, to really enforce would be the wrong word, but to ensure safe space was possible. Um, and so for when they're talking about it, they're really talking about it within their own spaces. And so I, again, would say, you know, reading her words and reading their words is the best way to see what that looks like. Um, in our process, for me, it had a lot to do with learning how to ask open-ended questions, but more than anything as a researcher, getting excellent at listening, getting excellent at listening. Because if you have like a um, interview protocol, you have certain questions that you are trying to hit on so that you are getting all of the answers to all of your sub questions, you are going to miss the entire story. And so, you know, some of the greatest training that I got, Mike Gunzenhauser's one of the kind of post-structuralists um, at the University of Pittsburgh who I worked for, he said the best thing you could do is to say to folks, when you ask them the first open-ended question and they give you a snapshot, say, tell me more. Can you tell me a story about that experience? And to just kind of um, interrogate a little bit more what you're hearing and in order to do that, you have to listen. It can't be like waiting so that you can ask your next question, right? So like when Awesome Woman told me that story about her experiences of schooling and during at, at, at year tw uh, age 12 in Sudan, I didn't anticipate that story coming up. And in the text, I published the whole story and it took almost two pages. Um, and there were people in higher ed, in academic publishing and other spaces who were like, that's too many words. That's too many words that the young folks threw out. And I was like, you need to hear this whole story. It is not my place to recap her story. It is, and this is where the collaborative element of it was really key, right? So this didn't, this went to press after they all had their eyes on it to make sure that these stories that they told, even though they were pseudonymous, that they still had ownership in deciding if they wanted things in or out. So I think the reflection process kind of, um, it went throughout and there were some young folks who I was able to see more frequently and dive deeper in and some of whom had more challenges in that regard. So we were able to go deeper with some than others. Um, and then in terms of the art that they created, so there was all kinds of different art that actually was being made out of, from these various young folks. And so Green Strawberries was doing a lot of like stenciling, um, what my friend, the poet Katie Byram calls kamikaze art. So just kind of rolling up on spaces and stenciling images. Um, and oftentimes with things like, it, we were talking about things like invisible ink or things that like give a temp, sometimes permanent, right? Sometimes spray paint, but things that also give you an opportunity to drop a, uh, temporal or impermanent um, iteration of what you're thinking into the space. Uh, awesome Woman was doing a ton of educational theater work at the time. And so she talks about, um, she talks about the, some of the theater she was involved in that was um, about the hijabi monologues, which is kind of like an iteration. It was built off of the idea, similar to Eve Ensler's vagina monologues. It's about the experiences of Muslim women. And so a lot of that was, some of it was institutional in nature when it started, and then a lot of it became um, extra institutional, meaning outside of the institutional space when the institution pushed back. Um, the, she was also engaged in a lot of video blogs that were going on, and some of it was that she heard something or someone said something to her, and she sat down and made a video blog about it. Um, and she has a line, and I have quoted it, I probably quoted this number of you who are my students, in which she says, um, it's not my job to be the Rosetta Stone of otherness for you. And that was something that really stood out to me across a lot of this work is that a ton of these young folks are positioned in spaces where someone wants to tokenize their experience or wants to essentialize what is true for them. Um, and, and, and I struggle with that with myself when people ask me about certain um, experiences and how is it that you can protect yourself and still make things and still disseminate what it is you want to disseminate and to really own what that looks like. So it's 10 after. I'm not sure if we need to wrap. So thank you all so much. I'm happy to hang out for further conversation. Thank you for coming out.